What a thrilling life awaits you. The acquisition of knowledge is a sacred activity. A truly educated man never ceases to learn. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. This BYU devotional address with Derek Marquis was given on April 5, 2011. Derek A. Marquis earned his bachelor's degree in communications with an emphasis in broadcast journalism from Brigham Young University in 2003. Excuse me, before 2003, and then in 2003 he received his MBA from the Marriott, from Marriott School of Management. Following his undergraduate program, he joined KSL Radio in Salt Lake City as a reporter and news anchor and then went on to serve as the news director of KUER, the national public radio affiliate at the University of Utah. Over the years, he has been a freelance reporter for CBS, National Public Radio, the Associated Press, and United Press International. I've mentioned to others I hope he speaks at my funeral because I love the sound of his voice. He returned to BYU in 1991 as the manager of corporate support for KBYU-TV and KBYU-FM. About four years ago, he was appointed managing director of BYU Broadcasting, the umbrella organization that operates the university's television and radio stations, as well as the university's broadcast-related websites. Brother Marquis was a missionary in the New York, New York, and the Brazil Sao Paulo North Missions, and has served in many church capacities since that time. Currently, he serves as ward clerk in his Linden home. He has been married to Colleen Clark Marquis for 24 years, and they are the parents of five daughters. Now we will have the pleasure of hearing from Brother Derek Marquis. A few weeks ago on a Sunday morning, I asked my daughters what they thought I should talk about in my devotional address this morning. My daughter Jessica, who will be an entering freshman here at BYU, said, maybe you should talk about see the good in the world. That's our tagline here at BYU TV. Her older sister Kylie, who is now a senior at BYU but happened to be home for the weekend, said, Dad, it really doesn't matter what you talk about. Just try not to put us to sleep. Jessica, you win. Kylie, I can't make any promises, but I do think you should go to bed earlier at night. <laughs> this morning marks your last devotional of what hopefully for you has been an incredible semester. For the many of you who will be graduating in a few days, this may also be the last devotional that you'll ever attend at BYU, or at least for a very long while. And whether this is your last for a few weeks or your last for a long time, I have prayed that the things I'll share with you will have some value as you prepare for your next semesters in school or your next chapters in life. In a moment, I'm going to ask those of you who have cell phones, iPhones, iPads, other portable devices, including those that don't start with the letter I, to hold them up. So if you could pull those from your backpacks without getting distracted and without playing words with friends or angry birds, that would help me a little bit later with an object lesson. When Mary Magdalene and the other Mary arrived at the empty tomb, they were greeted by an angel of the Lord who told them, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Matthew chapter 28 goes on to state, they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and with great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. Within a short period of time, we presume, remember they were running, the message had been delivered and the eleven disciples were again reunited with their Lord and Master. It was then that the Savior of the world gave his first post-resurrection commandments to his disciples. He told them, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. He didn't tell them to visit with their neighbors or to try to track out their communities, but rather to go and to teach all nations. I wonder if those 11 disciples or the other followers of Christ at the time stopped and asked themselves, either verbally or perhaps in their own minds and hearts, so how are we going to do this? 
We have these little fishing boats on the Sea of Galilee, and we don't mind walking a distance or maybe riding a donkey or a camel to a neighboring village, but really, we're supposed to teach all nations? Now, fast forward with me, if you will, about 1,800 years. Tomorrow, April 6, marks a very special anniversary for Latter-day Saints. It was on that day that the Prophet Joseph Smith gathered with a small group in a farmhouse in western New York and organized the Church of Jesus Christ. Imagine how those six charter church members must have felt when Joseph told them, and by the way, we're going to take this gospel of Jesus Christ to the entire world. If they stopped to consider what he was saying, can you imagine how overwhelming, perhaps even unrealistic, that charge must have felt to them? perhaps even to Joseph himself. The summary of the first section of the Doctrine and Covenant states that the voice of warning is to all people, not just to the followers of Joseph Smith, not just to that small gathering of saints assembled at that special conference in 1831 where this particular revelation was given, but to all people. Then, in the first and second verses at the beginning of the Doctrine and Covenants, verses that have become meaningful for me and my colleagues at BYU Broadcasting, the Lord states, Hearken, ye people from afar, and ye that are upon the islands of the sea. Listen together, for verily the voice of the Lord is unto all men, and there is none to escape, and there is no eye that shall not see, neither ear that shall not hear neither heart that shall not be penetrated. In our world today, it is easy for us, with our instantaneous access to modern technology, to comprehend at least some of the ways that the admonition of the Savior to his disciples or the early saints from the prophet Joseph can now be fulfilled and is beginning to be fulfilled. In earlier times, word traveled person to person or through written epistles. If someone needed a message to arrive quickly, they could run, or perhaps they could ride a horse or employ some other form of transportation that by today's standards would seem slow and primitive. If a message needed to reach a large group, they could speak from a hillside, or perhaps they could erect towers or cause that the copies of the message be painstakingly handwritten and distributed. Think of King Benjamin in the Book of Mormon and the tower that he built and stood upon so that his people could hear his voice. Obviously, such methods of communication pale in comparison to what we are able to do today. In fact, the marvels of what we're able to do today are so instantaneous and commonplace that some of us may miss the miracles that most of us hold in our very hands. Those gathered in this assembly today have almost certainly seen the new BYU Broadcasting Building just east of the Marriott Center. It is the home of the radio and television channels and the broadcast-related websites operated by Brigham Young University. For those who may be watching this address on television or the Internet, either in the United States or elsewhere in the world, this new building is the home of the channel you're watching right now, BYU TV. This morning's devotional, in fact, is being transmitted instantaneously to over 180 countries of the world via BYU TV. No pressure. (laughs) Likewise, as was explained by Elder Neil Anderson in Saturday's priesthood session, this past weekend's general conference was simultaneously translated into 93 languages and instantaneously transmitted to the four corners of the earth via television, radio, satellite transmission, and on the internet at lds.org, byutv.org, the Mormon Channel, and a host of other digital platforms. And as described in a recent Salt Lake Tribune article, 29 of those 93 languages from conference were actually translated in other countries as the interpreters received the live audio transmitted from Salt Lake City as the conference was taking place, and then from far-flung foreign lands, they translated the talks and instantly sent their translations back over the internet to Salt Lake City, where the audio was then married to the video and then instantly beamed out to the countries of the world where that particular language was needed. All this took place during a live broadcast all in a matter of seconds. 
The technologies behind so much of what we are so used to are indeed remarkable and miraculous. In 1947, when the technology of television reached less than one half of one percent of the homes in the United States, President George Albert Smith said, before us is the magic of television and a host of other remarkable discoveries. We ought to regard these inventions as blessings from the Lord. They greatly enlarge our abilities. They can indeed be blessings if we utilize them in righteousness for the dissemination of the truth and the furtherance of the work of the Lord among men. And in 1974, President Spencer W. Kemble said, King Benjamin caused a great tower to be erected, that thereby his people might hear the words which he should speak unto them. Our Father in heaven has now provided us mighty towers, radio and television towers, with possibilities beyond comprehension, to help fulfill the words of the Lord that the sound must go forth from this place unto all the world. I am confident, he said, that the only way that we can reach most of these millions of our Father's children is through the spoken word over the airwaves. Closed quote. I believe what prophets, seers, and revelators since the dawn of the Restoration have said, that the Lord has inspired good men and women throughout the ages, inventors, scientists, philosophers, and explorers, in ways that would lead to the furtherance of his work. Allow me to share with you just a few of the moments in the timeline of technology and the Church of Jesus Christ and this university. I start with the employment of the movable type printing press. It allowed the Book of Mormon and the Bible, of course, to be printed in mass as a testimony of the Savior Jesus Christ and of the restored gospel. It was in October of 1861 that the first transcontinental telegraph message was sent in the United States. It was sent by none other than the namesake of this university, Brigham Young. It was just two days later that the Pony Express system was deemed obsolete and ceased to operate. Indeed, the new technology of the telegraph had changed the world as they knew it. In 1897, the earliest audio recording was made of a president of the church. Wilfred Woodruff. His voice and testimony were recorded on a wax cylinder. I'd like to play a portion of that recording for you now. It's hard to understand, but keep in mind, this is from 1897 and recorded on a wax tube. I bear my testimony that Tony Smith was a true prophet of God. This is my testimony, both by myself, into a novel machine, on this tonight, we see a fact, it's under the night of death, in the night of birth, year of my age, will be with it. Incredible, isn't it? On May 6, 1922, President Heber J. Grant delivered the first church message broadcast on the first radio station in Utah, KZN, which we now all enjoy as KSL. It was that same year, 1922, that the first radio station owned by the church was established. And believe it or not, it was an experimental radio station operated by none other than the physics department here at Brigham Young University. Two years later, General Conference was broadcast for the first time on radio in October of 1924. And in July of 1929, the Tabernacle Choir's weekly music and the spoken word broadcast began, which continue today in what is now the longest continuously running broadcast program in the history of radio. I would also note that in each of these instances, our prophets were on the cutting edge of using emerging technologies to take the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. There are certainly many other mileposts in this timeline, but in the interest of our time this morning, I'm going to fast forward to a time when I was just a little bit younger than most of you. I remember fondly being a young Aaronic priesthood holder in the mid-1970s and sitting with my father in our chapel in Virginia, listening to the priesthood sessions of General Conference 
which were somehow piped in via a telephone line that somebody had dialed up to Salt Lake City and hooked up to the loudspeakers in the chapel. Now, perhaps a little out of sequence here, but I would be remiss and later questioned by my colleagues if I didn't mention in this timeline of technology in the church and the university, the earliest days of KBYU-FM, which just last year celebrated 50 years of broadcasting in Utah. KBYU-TV went on the air in 1965 from the university. BYU-TV, the channel I mentioned earlier, went on the air in the year 2000. And BYU-TV International went on the air in 2007 in English, Spanish, and Portuguese, 24 hours a day. We could go on and talk of the first satellite broadcast of the church or how the church has embraced technology, including the internet, including the church's YouTube channel or the church's Facebook pages or pages from the various departments of the university. It has been intentional, of course, that I've spent the first half of my talk extolling the virtues of the technologies before us as miracles and blessings from a loving Heavenly Father. But as we all know from Scripture mastery, there must needs be opposition in all things. We've likewise been warned by prophets, seers, and revelators that the adversary is embracing these same technologies to fulfill his purposes. Elder Russell M. Nelson, in his conference address just this last Saturday, spoke of this truth when he said, The forces of evil will ever be in opposition to the forces of good. Satan constantly strives to influence us to follow his ways and make us miserable even as he is. Closed quote. And in the priesthood session this past Saturday, President Monson said, the moral compass of the masses has gradually shifted to an almost anything goes position where once the standards of the church and the standards of society were mostly compatible, now there's a wide chasm between us and it is growing ever wider. Many movies and internet, excuse me, many movies and television shows portray behavior which is in direct opposition to the laws of God. Do not subject yourself to the innuendo and outright filth which are so often found there. Closed quote. Similar warnings and cautions have been given in past conferences and in other materials from the Brethren, such as in the For the Strength of Youth pamphlet. We've been cautioned regarding the internet, movies, music, video games, online chat, and social media sites, and the many other forms of media available to us today. I suspect that many of you, perhaps sadly, maybe even most of you, know of someone who once carried with them a wonderful spirit. But because of letting their guard down and being influenced by the side of the media that is not virtuous, lovely, of good report or praiseworthy, they lost the light they once carried with them. Some who have been overtaken by the darker side of these technological marvels have withdrawn from their families and loved ones. They've let their careers or schoolwork suffer, and they've turned from those things that once made them truly happy. And so, for the next few minutes, I'd like to share with you just a few of the things that we might do to keep us from falling into the adversary's technological trap. I'm going to focus on three main strategies, which mirror, by the way, the same strategies that we use at BYU Broadcasting as we're trying to expand to take the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Number one, decide today, right now, who you would like to be and whether your actions and the decisions that you are making today are leading you toward your goal or away from it. I refer to this step with the question, what's your tagline? Number two, conduct a self-assessment of your own consumption of media. Or in other words, ask yourself, what's on your playlist? Three, become anxiously and actively engaged in using these technologies for good. Or in other words, ask yourself, what's your role in all of this? So first, what's your tagline? I'd encourage you to decide today who you would like to be and whether the decisions and actions that you're making are leading you toward or away from your goal. 
this, of course, is not just true for the decisions that you're making regarding media consumption, but for a moment, let's consider it in that light. In the broadcast industry, media and television networks often use taglines, usually for branding or marketing purposes, but occasionally as corporate mission statements. Most use these taglines because they define how the networks want us, the viewers, to think of them. I suspect, for example, that most of you could tell me without even thinking about it the tagline for ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. TBS uses very funny, and in the 1990s, NBC rolled out must-see TV. I've already told you, BYU TV's tagline is see the good in the world. We use this tagline as the guiding principle for our programming decisions. So I ask you, what's your tagline? What would you like it to be? As you are considering this, you might also ask yourself, what would your friends and family members, your associates, what would they say is your tagline? Would they agree that the television programs you watch, the music you listen to, the internet sites you visit, the conversations in which you engage, would they agree that they reflect the tagline for which you wish to be known? I'm particularly fond of the tagline of the youth of the church, the one that they're aligning themselves with in Mutual this year, the 13th Article of Faith. BYU Broadcasting is likewise trying to model its program at programming after this theme. We believe in being honest, true, chaste, benevolent, virtuous, and in doing good to all men. And if there is anything virtuous, lovely, or of good report or praiseworthy, we seek after these things. Second, conduct a self-assessment of your own consumption of media, or using the terminology of today's generation, what's on your playlist? As you're deciding on this tagline, you need to assess whether the decisions that you're making around your media are compatible with your taglines. In other words, is the tagline credible that you've chosen when it's weighed against this playlist that I'm talking about? I'm not just talking about your iPods or your MP3 players, although they would certainly be included. Your playlist would include all of the daily decisions that you make. President Samuelson, in his opening devotional this semester, shared a quote from President David O. McKay regarding self-mastery and personal character. And then President Samuelson said, While President McKay did not live during the time of Internet, texting, tweeting, reality television, MP3 players, or social networking, the principles he taught are just as vital today as they were in the 20th century. We all know the blessings of appropriate self-control and the heartache attached to addictions or indiscretions of every kind. Just like King Benjamin, we can't list all of the ways we need to practice self-control. But King Benjamin's advice is absolutely timely. And then President Samuelson quoted the closing verses of one of my favorite chapters in the Book of Mormon, as it is, in my opinion, the perfect blueprint for how we should live our lives. From Mosiah chapter 4. And finally, I cannot tell you all the things whereby ye may commit sin, for there are diverse ways and means, even so many that I cannot number them. But this much I can tell you, that if ye do not watch yourselves, and your thoughts, and your words, and your deeds, and observe the commandments of God, and continue in the faith of what ye have heard concerning the coming of our Lord, even unto the end of your lives, ye must perish. And now, O man, remember and perish not. Several years ago, I was visiting with a friend in Mesa, Arizona. He was a stake president at the time, and he shared with me a very personal experience that, with his permission, I'd like to share with you this morning. He said, I was preparing for our stake conference and having a bit of a stupor of thought on what I should share with the members of my stake. On the Friday night prior to the conference, I had a most peculiar dream. He said it was one of those dreams that was as real as any experience that he had ever had while he was awake. He said, I dreamed I was at a family reunion with my entire family, my wife, my children, my grandchildren. We were all gathered in the backyard of our home and enjoying a wonderful spring afternoon together. 
And then he said, I saw the most amazing and beautiful sight. It was a flock of blackbirds, but not an ordinary flock of blackbirds. He said, this was one of those flocks that must have had tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of blackbirds, all flying gracefully in perfect unison. He said the birds would dart one direction, and then, as if cued from their leader, they'd immediately dart the other direction. Not a bird was missing a beat. He said, I stood there with my family, eyes transfixed. It was beautiful and captivating. And as we watched this spectacle, he continued, the birds came closer and closer to us. It was all very exciting. As we watched, though, we noticed that the birds were pairing off two by two, and they were landing in the backyards of the homes of all of my neighbors. He said, I thought this was rather peculiar. And then, as they got closer to my own backyard, the scene began to come into focus, and I realized in an instant that these were not blackbirds after all. He said these were dark, evil spirits. Immediately, he said, I panicked and I yelled to my family to run into the house and to lock the doors and the windows. I was frantically trying to make sure all of the members of my family were accounted for and safe, my sweetheart, my children, and their children. He said we ran through the house, slamming the windows and shutting the doors and locking them. He said, I gathered everyone together in the family room where I thought we would be safe. But then, as I turned around, there they were. He said, I found myself standing between these two terribly evil beings and my precious family. A window had somehow been left ajar in the basement, and they found their way into our home. Closed quote. You know and I know that the adversary and his evil spirits are descending upon our families and trying to find their way into our homes and our apartments and our dorms. At first, they appear to be beautiful, enticing, even captivating, even to the point that if we're not careful, we will allow our families to stand right in the path, gazing upon them as though we are extending an open invitation to them to enter into our homes. So again, I would ask you to consider the question, what's on your playlist? Third, become actively engaged in using these technologies for good. In his Sermon on the Mount, the Savior taught, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. At BYU Broadcasting, and with most every other media organization in the world, we know that television and media in general are no longer push technologies for passive viewing experiences. Today's audiences, I'm talking about each of you, want to be engaged. They want to participate in the conversation. So now, here's our object lesson. Those of you here today with a portable device a digital device, a cell phone, an iPhone, an iPad, a laptop, hold it up in the air if you can do that without dropping it on the person in front of you. Look around you. Look at the hands. Incredible, isn't it? If such a request had been made when I was a student at BYU, not a single hand would have gone up. Thank you. Students as young as elementary and junior high school, but more frequently high school and college-age students, including many of you here at BYU, are very much engaged in the worldwide online community. You are building your own websites, iPhone and iPad apps, and other digital social media applications. You are shooting and editing and uploading videos to your own websites and other public sites like YouTube. And as we heard two weeks ago from Mark Zuckerberg in this very room, over 500 million people, including most of you, now have a Facebook account. 
speaking at graduation exercises at both BYU-Idaho and BYU-Hawaii, Elder M. Russell Ballard, has encouraged our BYU students to not just see the good, but to do the good. He told them to join the conversation by participating on the Internet. Quote, How different your world is today. If you read the newspapers, chances are you read them on the Internet. Yours is the world of cyberspace, cell phones that capture video, video downloads and iTunes, social networks like Facebook, text messaging and blogs, handhelds and podcasts. There are conversations, Elder Ballard said, going on about the church constantly. Those conversations will continue whether or not we choose to participate in them. But we cannot stand on the sidelines while others including our critics, attempt to define what the church teaches. And this past Sunday morning, you'll remember President Uchtdorf told us, with so many social media resources and a multitude of more or less useful gadgets at our disposal, sharing the good news of the gospel is easier and the effects more far-reaching than ever before. Perhaps the Lord's encouragement to open our mouths might today include using your hands to blog and text message the gospel to all the world. With the blessings of modern technology, we can express gratitude and joy about God's great plan for his children in a way that can be heard not only around our workplace, but around the world. Closed quote. Brothers and sisters, you are the light of the world, and you are the future mileposts in the timeline of technology. May we recognize a loving Heavenly Father's hand in the miracles of the technologies around us and remember that He gave them to bless us and our families and to advance His work. May we hold strong to the taglines and playlists that we wish to be known for and may we be actively engaged in the cause of truth as we seek to not only see the good, but to be the good and to do the good. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. This BYU devotional address with Derek Marquis was given on April 5th, 2011. 